Hey friends, did you know that by the end of 2022, over 86% of all software used by companies will likely be hosted as a service. So if you're building software as a service, you need to plan how you'll architect your solution so that it scales and performs well as your customer base grows. John Downs is here to show me how today on Azure Friday. Hey friends, I'm Scott Hansman and it's Azure Friday. I'm here with John Downs, how are you? Very well, thank you, Scott. All right, so we're going to learn about multi-tenancy, and this is a really, really interesting space. You know, before the cloud, it was an interesting space, and the cloud makes it even more interesting. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We work a lot with startups and independent software vendors, what we call ISVs, uh, and other customers who are building, for example, their software as a service and selling it to their customers. Uh, we also work with enterprises who who will build up uh, kind of enterprise wide platforms that uh, that that lots of other teams inside their enterprise can use as well. And all of these are examples of, of what we call multi tenant services, mm -hmm. uh, which basically mean that you have multiple customers or tenants uh, all using the same service and, and sharing all the resources in some way. Okay. So historically, a tenant has been someone who like lives in your space or occupies land. So if you are, if I have a house, I'll rent it out to a tenant. And if I have a piece of hardware, I could put some software on it and then I could put a tenant in there like a company. And in the old days, uh, maybe I would use a virtual machine, maybe not too old of days. And I'd have like one virtual machine per tenant. Uh, why is that not a, a, a simple solution? We can just have a VM per, per tenant. Well, in, in some architectures, that actually works really well. And if, if you've got requirements that, that are going to lead you to that, then that's that's perfectly great. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I guess Azure provides a lot of other ways that you can architect a multi-tenant solution. Uh, so you have to think about all the different layers of the, the stack and how you're going to plan all of those for multi-tenancy. So for example, your networking and your compute, like you talked about, uh, storage and data, uh, messaging, all these different components might have different requirements for multi-tenancy depending on what you're trying to do and depending on your business model. So if you're, if you're planning, for example, to create a multi-tenant uh, music streaming service or photo sharing service or something like that that you're selling to consumers, you probably don't want to be provisioning virtual machines for every single customer who comes along because that's going to get very expensive very quickly. And it's also going to be very inefficient because most of the time those services are going to sit unused. So having some way of sharing some of those resources means that you can reduce your cost um, while also still maintaining really high performance and, and, and high service quality. You know, that's a great example. So for example, I have a, a NAS, a network attached storage device here, and it has a photo sharing. It has like a, you know, a photos clone on it. And I'm realizing that I have a whole computer that runs this one app that does my photo sharing. So I am the tenant. So when they architected this, they planned it for me, for one person. So they didn't have to think about a bunch of stuff, but it cost me a lot because I have a whole computer there. So certainly if I was going to have a million of somebody or even a couple of thousand, it's not only expensive to have one VM or one thing, but also I'd have to update the software on each of them and keep them all together. That would be a huge problem. So then exactly. people are going to be next door to each other. Like the tenants are going to be, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a high rise, like with apartments. What if they're going to hear each other in the walls, right? When you get people close together, privacy concerns become an issue. Absolutely. We call that the noisy neighbor problem for exactly mm -hmm. that reason. Uh, and that can happen in lots of different places in a multi-tenant solution. We running Azure actually have to be worried about this problem too, right? Because Azure is a multi-tenant service and we need to make sure that that when you use, for example, a storage account or app service, that you're not going to be impacted by what other people are doing. Um, it's exactly the same thing when you're providing your own multi-tenant service. You need to be worried about these kinds of things and you need to make sure that, that you monitor uh, for, for any kinds of problems that you're going to have uh, between tenants uh, and that you provision enough capacity or put, uh, put constraints or limits in, however you want to deal with that. Uh, but there's lots of different things to consider depending on, your, on exactly what you're trying to, uh, to build. Now, this word though, tenant, I hear this a lot when I hear about Azure AD, Azure Active Directory tenants. Are we reusing a word here? And how do I make sure I don't get those two confused? Yeah, it's often a point of confusion, actually. So Azure AD does use the word tenant, uh, and you can do all sorts of interesting things with Azure AD. So if you have a company, you probably have an Azure AD tenant to represent all of the users in that company and everything that company does. Um, 
other companies will have their own tenants and you can do things like federate those together and sign into each other's tenants and, and do all sorts of things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. That's a kind of a, an example of multi-tenancy uh, and it's, it's an Azure specific example of multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. but, but when we're thinking about multi-tenancy in, in this context, we're really thinking about the services that you would build if you were building your own startup or, or SaaS service or whatever it is. Uh, so you need to think about all the same kinds of things that Azure AD thinks about, uh, but you, you, they're, they're, they're kind of a, it's a more abstract concept than just what Azure AD is doing. Okay, so uh, taking that abstract concept and putting it in with something concrete, I have a blog. It runs in an Azure app service. Mm -hmm. um, let's say it has a database behind it. Right mm -hmm. now, the, it has one user, me. If I wanted to turn that blog into WordPress.com, I haven't architected it in any way to do that. I don't really have a choice. So it sounds like there's a there's an important checklist and there's a whole series of architectural questions I need to ask myself if I were going to go and make a multi-tenant blog and do it for a reasonable cost on Azure. Absolutely, yeah. And so over the last year or so, actually, um, I and, and a bunch of my colleagues throughout Microsoft have been working on putting together that guidance because that was something that we really noticed a lot of customers we were working with uh, could really benefit from. So we've we've started putting together this material on the Azure Architecture Center um, to kind of think through all of the different aspects of how you would design a solution to be multi-tenanted. Everything from the kinds of questions you need to ask and the business decisions you need to make and how they impact the architecture through to how you can use specific Azure services and features of Azure services um, to support your whatever your multi-tenancy model is. Uh, so we're trying to cover that entire kind of spectrum of, of all the different considerations you need to have for multi-tenancy. So show me what that guidance looks like. Yeah, sure. So it's part of the Azure Architecture Center, like I said, and we, we put it under the application architecture fundamentals because multi-tenancy is a really fundamental part of designing a solution on Azure. It's very difficult to bolt on multi-tenancy after you've already built the solution. It sometimes can be done, uh, but it's usually a much more expensive and costly thing to do. So we, we like to think about doing this early, early in the design process, or at least thinking this through early in the design process. So the, the, the guidance really is, is split across three main parts. The first part is the considerations for multi-tenancy. So these cover a whole bunch of the different kind of big picture questions that, for example, the CTO of a startup or a product designer might need to think about. And so if we look at some examples there, um, you talked about the different tenancy models earlier around, you know, should you share virtual machines or should you uh, deploy dedicated virtual machines? There's a whole bunch of nuance there around exactly how you make those decisions, depending on the type of solution that you're building. Um, and so you need to actually decide, first of all, what kind of, how are you defining what a tenant is? What requirements are they coming along with? And then you can start planning uh, what level of isolation you need. And in some cases, that might be fully isolated, where you basically share nothing. Every tenant gets their own dedicated resources. That can work well in solutions where, you, for example, you're, you're only ever going to have five customers, and you know that they are banks, for example, and they need to have completely dedicated infrastructure. Or on the other extreme, you can share everything, and then you, you get a lot more cost efficiency, but you need to make sure that multi-tenancy is really planned very, very well throughout your architecture. And there's also a whole bunch of things in between. This is a really great diagram. Like you could even drill down even more into that diagram. That diagram says mm -hmm. a lot because I used to work in banking mm -hmm. and we would have a basically like a, you know, a business slider bar, we'll call it. And, you know, a giant bank, you know, big bank with millions of dollars and millions of people would have fully isolated, shared nothing. And that worked great. And the same exact software that we wrote could also be used in small credit unions or building societies. But all of them, because it was a bank, insisted on separate databases. So we didn't go all the way to fully shared. We, we kept it as a business decision to have separate databases because it made more sense as a bank. Absolutely, yeah. And that's a very common architecture we see. We, we've called it horizontally partition deployments. Uh, it's one, one of those kind of in-between models of multi-tenancy mm -hmm. uh, where you still get some cost benefit out of being able to share things like your web server, your networking layers, uh, management, all those kinds of things. But you're giving tenants some level of isolation with their data. Uh, whether that actually gives you any real security benefit depends on how you've designed that as well. Because if your web server has all the connection strings for all of these databases, then essentially the web server is the point where that, that could accidentally leak data between the tenants. So you need to be very careful when you design your software as well. Um, but, but certainly this is a very common tenancy pattern that we see. 
Yeah. Um, we also, we make very heavy use of something called the deployment stamp pattern as well. This is where you can have multiple deployments of the same service. So you can um, basically create templates and, and scripts and, uh, and really have identical deployments. And then you can put different tenants on different deployments. Uh, and you might put those deployments in different regions. So for example, for data uh, residency purposes or for performance reasons, um, or you can just dedicate uh, deployments to specific tenants if they come to you and say, we need dedicated infrastructure. Um, so for example, in, in this, this example here, you know, tenant A and B are sharing one deployment and sharing a single database. Tenant C has their own uh, completely dedicated deployment with their own database. And that might be because tenancy has some sort of uh, compliance requirement that, that means that they need to be on their own infrastructure. So this really emphasizes the fact that you need to have a very clear understanding of what your tenant's requirements are. Uh, because without that, if you just make assumptions about kind of how you can share resources or whether you should share any resources at all, you could end up either painting yourself into a corner and, and making it very difficult to, to support tenants' requirements later, uh, or overspending and, and, and provisioning a whole bunch of resources that you could have otherwise shared. Yeah. And in a world that very much values privacy and security, thinking about what is your data doing at rest? What is your data doing on the wire? And what is your data doing as it moves through processes and through threads? Are you reusing processes? Are you reusing threads? Are you cleaning up after yourself? You know, you'd hate to have two people from two different tenants log in nearby each other and then switch identities. I think we've all once or twice had that experience. Where we've logged into some financial institution and seen someone else's balances. That would be a mistake, an, an architectural flaw or a code flaw, wouldn't it be, in a multi-tenant model? That's right. Yeah. And all of the good kind of design practices and, and, and coding practices still apply. So we actually um, heavily emphasize the use of things like Azure Chaos Studio to start for testing for some of those kinds of edge cases where your, your application might be uh, under load or, or having kind of some, some unusual requirements, uh, some unusual situations, uh, and making sure that, that everything still is isolated correctly, that your tenants aren't seeing each other's data, uh, that the performance is still acceptable and so forth. This sounds like a lot of information here. What mm. would you say if someone felt overwhelmed by this? This is a lot. Like this is very complete and very thoughtful. Where do, where would you start? It really comes down to the business, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So I think a lot of these, a lot of the the consideration section, at least, is is really based around trying to think through all the different options that you've got and how you might come to those decisions. Uh, having a really clear idea of your business model and your plans will, will help a lot. So for example, um, the pricing model that your, uh, that your application or that your service is going to be um, uh, using will, will really dictate a lot of things that, that come about uh, later in your architectural design process. So, for example, if you're going to be charging for consumption, so in other words, uh, as, as an individual tenant uses more of your service, then you need to charge them more. Uh, that's going to have a very different way of, of architecting it than, for example, if you have a flat rate pricing where uh, everybody gets charged the same amount regardless of how much they use it. Uh, there's also tiered pricing where you can, might charge, for example, a, a gold, silver, bronze kind of tiered pricing. Uh, and if you're doing any of these kinds of architectures then or any of these kinds of pricing models, your architecture needs to be able to support it. So, for example, if you have to have multiple tiers that have different guarantees around performance or reliability, uh, then that means that you're going to have to start thinking about doing things like, for example, having different deployment stamps for each tier that will have different types of resources in them. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there's there's starting from the the, the business requirements is really really important. Um, but I'd say if you if you're just getting started, then having a read through these considerations is probably the the, the key thing to to really get to understand you know the the, the broad concepts of multi tenancy and all the different things you need to worry about. And most of these are fairly high level. But we do talk about some specific things in here as well, like, for example, deploying updates. If you've got a multi-tenant service and you need to update the software, uh, there's often that can be quite challenging to actually coordinate that and, and figure out who gets which updates when. Similarly, for domain names, if you've got to allow customers to bring their own domain names because they want to see their own kind of uh, their own branded domain name on their service instance, uh, that can bring along some other complexities as well. So these considerations are fairly high level uh, and, and hopefully will, will help to kind of understand the, the, the problem space you're in at least and point you to some specific solutions. One of the sections that I was particularly impressed with, if I may, was under uh, the tenant life cycle because it called out specifically that a trial tenant, like, oh, I'm going to give it a 30-day trial. 
could potentially be its own thing. You could compartmentalize it. And you might say that those you could save money because these people might not be paying yet. Are they subject to the same data security requirements? Do they get the same performance? But then if they decide to start paying, how do you get them out of there? Uh, there's a whole world in how to come up with a fair 30-day trial or whatever without breaking the bank. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really good example. And there's another really kind of interesting nuanced example that, that we've seen some customers struggle with, which is if you, for example, sell your, your, um, your, your software to a bank, what happens if that bank gets acquired? And then uh, the, the parent company that they've, they've now uh, been absorbed into also uses your service. Do you keep the two tenants separate? Do you merge them together? Or if you're selling software to a family, like a photo sharing service, what happens if one of the family members leaves? Then can they take their photos with them? Are the photos, do the photos belong to the family? So thinking through all of those kinds of um, uh, different points at which tenants can change and the infrastructure that they're running on can change, that's also really important because it's something that you might not think about early uh, if, you're not, if you're not kind of told to do so. Uh, but if, if a customer comes along to you and says, we've just been acquired or we've just split out this particular part of our business, you don't want to be trying to figure that out on the fly. You need to have a plan for what you're going to do there. Yeah. And while this might initially feel like an overwhelming checklist of stuff that you need to do, what this really is, is a great complete list of considerations. And it, it, it's meant for you to go in eyes wide open. Like That's we right. have thought about this and every decision was even a decision to do nothing. For example, mm -hmm. merging and splitting tenants. Mm -hmm. Let's just decide to do nothing. That's a great problem. We'll have that problem later. It's up to us, but at least we thought about it and we made a decision as opposed to just letting the default happen. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then what the other thing we need to think about then is once we've thought through some of these, these higher level considerations, then we need to start thinking about how we actually apply that to an architecture. And so in the guidance, we've got a second section, which we've called approaches. And these cover off the kind of the main um, areas of, of, of an architecture, right? So the main categories of Azure services or, or other cloud services. Um, and so we, we start thinking about all the different things that you need to do if you're building, for example, a multi-tenant compute tier. Um, you need to, in any cloud service, you probably need to think about scale. But when you work with multi-tenancy, there are some specific things to think about. So for example, um, when, you, when you have a, a very high scale application, one of the things you can often do is, is add more workers to your to your compute pool, right? So you, you scale out essentially. Um, if you do that in a multi-tenant service, that can become more problematic because let's imagine that you've got an in-memory cache on one of those servers. Um, then all the requests that come in for a particular tenant, do they? Do you need to pin, pin those to particular servers to make sure that they can actually reuse the data from that cache? Um, it gets a bit more complicated just to think through all of these different uh, levels of your, your architecture. And so we and our team have, have worked a lot with customers who build multi-tenant solutions. Uh, we've seen kind of what works and what doesn't. And so we put together this guidance based around the kinds of the approaches and the patterns that we see working well as well as some of the things that we say you should try and avoid. Uh, so particular uh, concerns or particular things that we've seen customers do that, that can lead them down a bad path. A really good example of that is in the, when you're working with storage uh, or databases, uh, don't, for example, scale your your database don't scale your database by adding more tables for each tenant right you want to either scale the entire database uh, or scale within a database uh, if you don't do that then it becomes very difficult to manage data and, and so forth and we've seen customers unfortunately uh, go down that path yeah this is a huge amount of work like you we've just touched on this we could go probably for another hour there's a whole section under service specific guidance so now that you understand these things let's apply those uh, thoughts and that analysis to compute. Let's apply it to Azure App Service and functions. We've talked about things kind of philosophically, processes and, and, and tables and table storage, but what does that mean to Cosmos people? What does that mean to SQL as a service people? All hmm. of these things are addressed in this, uh, in this guidance that you've put together. Yeah, we've we've started going down, down the process of, of of creating this service specific guidance for some of the common services that we see working uh, in multi tenant solutions. So we don't have every service here. Um, we're not planning to. Uh, we've just got a few. We've got eight at the moment. We're having uh, we're working on more of that as well. Um, and and the the goal of the these sections is to talk about the features of these particular Azure services that are particularly helpful for multi tenant solutions. It's not designed to tell you everything you need to know about the service. Every service has its own documentation for that. These are really highlighting specific things that you can use or that you might want to stay away from uh, in a multi-tenant service. 
Mm -hmm. So for example, app service, uh, you mentioned that. Um, so app service allows you to do things like hosting your own domain names on app service. But if you're going to be hosting a multi-tenant service and all of your tenants need to bring their own domains, you need to think very carefully about how you manage uh, the, the, the management of that, right? How do you add new domains? How do you move domains around if you're moving uh, customers between uh, different app service instances? Uh, and then how do you take them off again? Uh, and what are the limits around that, right? So sometimes some of these services will have specific limits around how many configurations for a particular type you can apply. Mm -hmm. So you might need to then plan scaling based on some of those limits as well. Um, so we, we've talked through, you know, all of the, the different aspects of, of Azure uh, App Service and, and functions uh, that we've seen, as well as isolation. Um, and this is a really important point for all the different services you're thinking about sharing. You need to understand the different options you've got for sharing or isolating your services. Um, so, for example, an app service, you can, you can have uh, individual apps per tenant. You can have individual plans per tenant, or you might share everything. And there are pros and cons uh, and, and kind of trade-offs each way. So we've really tried to be comprehensive here and, and not try to cover every aspect of every service, but just point you to the particular things that, that if you're designing a service that's going to be using uh, these, these particular products, um, then here are the things that you really need to think about. Fantastic. So folks can get this at the tiny URL, aka .ms slash multi-tenancy. Very easy to remember, aka.ms slash multi-tenancy. We have links in the show notes. This has been fantastic. We, seriously, this is a great area. You could teach a class on how to do multi-tenancy correctly. Thanks, Scott. All right. I am learning all about making multi-tenant solutions on Azure with John Downs today on Azure Friday. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Azure Friday. Now I need you to like it, comment on it, tell your friends, retweet it, watch more Azure Friday.